thankful for each and every one of you being here this morning. And as always, I'm thankful to be able to stand before you to deliver a lesson from God's Word. Now, Brother Cone and I did not coordinate our lessons. But if you heard his lesson on Wednesday night, it was, first off, very well done. But it also served as a very excellent introduction to what I was planning on speaking about this morning. So if you could call to mind his, his lesson that he had, it would be very useful. So much of what we must deal with today in our society can be traced back to secular humanism. And that really all is a departure from God and his will for man. We can note from Romans chapter 1 verses 21 through 28 that at some point in man's history, all men knew God. Take it a step further, they even obeyed God. But through process of time, we didn't like to retain God in our knowledge. So we didn't obey Him. We pushed Him out of our minds. Thus all manner of sin was committed and still is committed by most of the world today. This attitude distorts the mind and eventually disrupts entire societies. You have little to no regard for authority, not only from God, but in general. You have no regard for human life, nor even of the things of God. Our very own public school system pushes the doctrine of, human, of secular humanism, especially in the biology classes and really any, any class of science that touches on evolution. Now this morning, I would like for us to take this time to deal with a foundational matter. And that is the creation of the world. It is a it's a fundamental truth, it's foundation, because everything else beyond Genesis, really even chapter 1 of Genesis, is built on the truth found in it. If you can disprove Genesis 1, the rest of the Bible is worthless. Because there is no God that cares about you. There is no God that loves you if evolution is true. So I'd like for us to study, particularly, Genesis chapter 1, the first five verses. I'd also like to note a quote from Albert Einstein. He said, scientists are possessed by the sense of of universal causation. Now the law of cause and effect states that every material effect has a superior cause. Now that superior cause is both quantitatively, quantitatively superior as well as qualitatively superior. Now statement, the universe exists. There are only three possible explanations for its existence. The first one, the universe, is eternal. This is an easy explanation for the evolutionist. It's quite simple. It's always been here. The way they tried to explain it at one point was to say that hydrogen atoms, I think they call them isotrons, randomly appeared so that the universe could always be sustained with matter. They, they call this the steady state theory. Uh, Robert Jastrow stated this in his book, Until the Sun Dies. Uh, he's an astronomer. says, The proposal for the creation of matter out of nothing possesses a strong appeal to the scientist, since it permits him to contemplate a universe without beginning and without end. So it's really the lazy way out. He later wrote, But the creation of matter out of nothing would violate a cherished concept in science the principle of conservation of matter and energy, which states that matter and energy can neither be created nor destroyed. <coughs> matter can be converted into energy and vice versa, but the total amount of all matter and energy in the universe must remain unchanged forever. It is difficult to accept a theory that violates such a firmly established scientific fact. And finally from him, he quotes, or we quote him, the lingering decline predicted by astronomers for the end of the world differs from
from the explosive conditions they have calculated for its birth. But the impact is the same. Modern science denies an eternal existence to the universe, either in the past or in the future. So they even debunk their own theory. Our second option. This is perhaps the one we are most familiar with. The universe is self-creating. They, they state that literally matter created itself. It came into existence. They also call this inflation theory. We know it as the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory represents uh, the cosmologist's best attempt to reconstruct a 14 billion year old story of the universe based on a sliver of existence visible today. Uh, one of the scientists that I'm, I'm citing here, his name is Paul Steinhardt. He's a cosmologist at Princeton. He says the Big Bang is really a bad term. He says the big stretch would capture the right idea. The mental image of an explosion causes all kinds of confusion, according to Steinhardt. It implies a central point, an expanding frontier, and a scene where light shrapnel flies faster than heavier chunks. But an expanding universe looks nothing like that, he said. There's no center, no edge, no galaxies large and small. They all slide apart the same way. What? You don't like Big Bang because it conveys the wrong idea, but you like the Big Stretch because it conveys a better idea. I'll let you ponder on that. Now, from a scientist that we're probably much more familiar with, he says the new inflationary model was a good attempt to explain why the universe is, excuse me, is the way it is. In my personal opinion, the new inflationary model is now dead as a scientific theory. Although a lot of people do not seem to have heard of its demise and are still writing papers on it as if it were still viable. That, was, that statement was made in 1988 by none other than Stephen Hawking, astrophysicist. Well, Mr. Hawking, it's good to know that you gave up the belief of your doctrine, though he might not have really wanted to say that. Either way, they're left with nothing, which brings us to our third option. The universe was created. We know that the universe is, in fact, an effect. Therefore, a superior cause must exist, not might, but a superior cause must exist. The Bible answers this issue. It's called special creation. We find it in Genesis chapter 1. In that, the first verse of the Bible, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. What a simple statement, but quite profound. We know that there are five fundamental principles laid out in this verse. We have in the beginning. Well, this is time. This is referencing time. The beginning of time, how we... You know, it's 11.16 right now. In one minute, it'll be 11.17. And beyond that, it's something that we can measure. But it's a physical entity. It's a physical thing. We note God. God is force, power, and authority. And then created. This is action or motion. And then the heaven. Well, this refers to space, not the reigning place of God the Father. Then also the earth. This refer, or refers to matter in general, not the planet that we now inhabit. Now often, the atheist, the agnostic, and their really fellow evolutionists might ask you, well, okay, you say God created all this. Where did God come from? It's really a statement of their ignorance. But we would like to point out that time, space, and matter, all three form a continuum. That simply means that all three of them must come into existence at precisely the same moment. 
Otherwise, when would you put that matter? Or even where would you put it? They all must come into existence at the same time. Now this concept of time, space, and matter is, is in and of itself a trinity. It is also a trinity of trinities. Time consists of past, present, and future. Space consists of length, width, and height. And matter exists in solid, liquid, and gas states. So you have a trinity creating a trinity of trinities. Now oftentimes as well, they might say, well, one plus one plus one is three. So you serve three gods. Well, that's right. That would not add up. But one times one times one is what? One. You see that? One. Okay, when you find the volume of a cube or any three-dimensional shape, you don't add the sides together. You multiply them, and you're given a unit of volume. Now, we must note some causes and or the following cause and effect. We can observe, we can know that there is limitless space. Therefore, the cause must be infinite. There is endless time. Therefore, the cause must be eternal. Boundless energy exists. Therefore, the cause of that energy must itself be omnipotent, all-powerful. There is universal interrelationships. Thus, the, uh, the cause must be omnipresent, existing everywhere at once. There is infinite complexity. Therefore, the cause must be omniscient. And there is life. I'm alive. Each of you are still alive. Therefore, the cause of this life must be living. Therefore, we, we are accused of defining God into existence. It's not defining something into existence if you're applying certain terms that really point out the definition of that being. This uncaused first cause must possess all of these traits and many more that we're not going to talk about today. But they must possess these traits in order to be a sufficient cause of all the effects that you now see in this physical world. Matter cannot account for these, not matter alone. However, we do know what can and did account for these things, does account for these things. That's Jehovah God. Now we consider the physical existence. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 through 5, we would like to note, it says, And the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now going back to the first verse, that word created. That's the Hebrew word bara. This term is used specifically with God to create something from nothing. It means to create, shape, or form. Commonly called ex nihilo, from nothing. Matter cannot do this. Otherwise, it wouldn't be matter. Matter is already in existence. Therefore, how can it create something out of nothing? Okay, God is beyond the physical realm. But he has the ability, he does operate within the physical realm. For he created it. The term heaven, we've noted before, is the Hebrew shamayim shamaya which refers to space, the universe at large. Uh, the Hebrews did not have a term for the universe. So this is really a accommodative language for us to realize that is, God didn't create his dwelling place. He created the universe at large, space. Again, we know this is not where God reigns. The earth here is the Hebrew word Eretz, 
which refers to general matter, not the planet that we are all inhabiting at this time. We're looking at the building blocks, if you will, of all structures without the universe or throughout the universe. Verse 2, we point out that the earth was without form. It wasn't arranged yet. It was void. It was empty of life. It was not laid desolate in the sense that many would try to sneak evolution into the, the first creation week. We will deal with that later, at a later date anyway. And this matter, this earth, was in the water, in the deep. Peter says in, in uh, check, Second Peter chapter 3, verses 4 through 5, it was in the water and standing out of the water. And finally, we note from verse 2 of Genesis 1 that the Spirit of God moved. Now this word rakaf in Hebrew means to brood, flutter, move, or shake. If you've ever been around birds, especially chickens or turkeys, and they lay eggs, what do you typically see them doing with those eggs? Well, they're laying on them. They're trying to keep them warm. And if it's, if it's colder than what they normally like to deal with, they'll start shaking. <coughs> kind of like when you get cold and you get goosebumps. That's your body trying to say, okay, we're going to warm up. You start shivering. Well, movement generates heat. That's the picture that we have here, the Spirit of God energizing the matter that has just been created. This same term is used in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11. The same picture there, we have the eagle brooding over her nest, keeping those eggs warm. We'd also like to reference Job chapter 26, verse 13. Now, in verse 3 of chapter 1, we find really the first command. In the Hebrew, it says, and God said, let light be. And light was. Do you think light had an option of coming into existence? Absolutely not. God Almighty said, let light be. And light was. This is the Hebrew word or. Now the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia points out this about light. The creation of light was the initial step in the creation of life. Let there be light was the first word of God spoken after his creative spirit moved upon the primary, uh, primary material out of which he created the heavens and the earth and which lay until the utterance of that word in darkness. Something akin possibly to the all-pervasive electromagnetic activity of the aurora borealis penetrated the night of the world. The origin of light thus finds its explanation in the purpose and very nature of God, whom John defines as not only the author of light, but in an all-inclusive sense as light itself. For God is light, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Spoiler alert, the sun is not in existence at this time, but light is. It can be de best defined as that electromagnetic activity that we can perceive. The light spectrum. The light givers were not in existence at this time. Now, it references the aurora borealis. I would like to see that one day where you have different particles hitting the Earth's atmosphere and giving a very pretty light show to those viewers. That's the idea that we receive from the light referenced in Genesis 1-3. We would also like to note that this command used words. Just like in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. The Spirit speaketh expressly. The way of communication is using some type of word. You might use your hands to convey a message. You might write something down, and you might even speak it. But you're still using words. That's exactly what God did when he spoke these things into existence. He used words. Word is logos. We we find this term being used in, in John chapter one verses one through third or one through three, 
It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word is Jesus. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the eternal Word. We see Him acting in creation when these words are spoken. So the Father gave the command. The second person of the Godhead carried it out. He executed the Father's will. We see this in verse 3. So at this point, we note that all three persons of the Godhead have been active in creation. God spoke. The Father spoke. The first person the Godhead spoke. The Spirit of God moved, prepared, energized the matter that existed. And you have the second person of the Godhead organizing, executing the will of heaven, the will of the Father. Uh, Psalm chapter 30, or Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And verse 9, For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. What marvelous words. But it further solidifies the concepts that we've just talked about. Carrying on the note of the, the Spirit brooding over the matter, we note some scientific principles at this time. Both matter and light behave both as a particle and a wavelength. Light comes in the form of photons and matter in atoms. If you examine an atom, it's just sitting there spinning. You've got electron or multiple electrons orbiting around a nucleus of either one proton or depending on how big the element is, several protons and neutrons. All these particles are acting together as a nucleus surrounded by at least one electron. It's almost as if you see God's signature in matter. That's exactly what it is. And with light, you have wavelengths. That's why we're able to see certain colors over others. And then, of course, as we stated, they exist as photons as well. Kohler wrote, it seems that at this point, God began to energize the raw material that he made in verse 1. The oscillation on the face or surface of the deep, which is really what the hovering could be compared to, created the movement of the inert elements. It is interesting that all matter and energy at their core are simply wavelengths. Matter acts as both a particle and as a wave. Now it has taken man quite some time to prove that this is the case. But here we have it in the beginning of time, clearly stated for us if we are to believe it. Now we note in verses 4 and 5 that the works of day 1 were all labeled as good. It is also essential that we point out that the word for day here is the Hebrew word yom. And every time that a number is used, whether it be one, two, three, or first, second, third, in front of this term yom, it means a literal 24-hour period. That is exactly what you can read here at the end of verse 5, the first day. This was a literal 24-hour period of creation. Now this morning, I certainly hope that this, this lesson has been beneficial to you. As we, as we referenced in the beginning, Psalm 11, verse 3. You know, whenever we build a house, we like to prepare the ground. We like to either lay out beams or lay a slab. In fact, this very building that you're, you're in right now has a slab underneath it. The foundation was laid. God has given us the tools and the supplies needed for us to build our own foundation. He will not build it for us in the sense of our own personal uh, coming to understanding. He lays it all out there. These are the facts. It is up to us to assemble those facts, to form in our minds, 
to build faith, Romans 10, 17, and to come to the proper conclusion. Now, science, correctly used, is always going to point to God. Gerald Wald stated this, The reasonable view, reasonable view was to believe in spontaneous generation. The only alternative to believe in a single primary act of supernatural creation, there is no third, third position. This is, for this reason, many scientists a century ago chose to regard the belief in spontaneous generation as a philosophical necessity. It is a symptom of the philosophical poverty of our time that this necessity is no longer appreciated. Most modern biologists, having reviewed with satisfaction the downfall of the spontaneous generation hypothesis, yet unwilling to accept the alternative belief in special creation, are left with nothing. He is a professor of biology at Harvard University, at least he was. He apparently died in 1997. But when you do not like to retain God in your knowledge, as Paul tells us in Thessalonians, if you love not the truth, what else is there? A lie in every instance. When you run away from God, as was prayed earlier, if we draw not to God, the devil will run from us. He, he flees. But when we resist God and then run to Satan, there's no telling where we're going to end up. And that's where all these are that hold this view of spontaneous generation. Or they might not call it that. They might call it other things. But either way, that's what they're trying to push, secular humanism. Once you leave God, there's no bounds on where you'll end up. So we would like to start laying the foundation. That was the purpose of this lesson. If you've already got that foundation, great. I hope this served to fortify that foundation. But as the Hebrew writer wrote, in these later times, God has spoken to us through his son. You will not find out how to be saved in Genesis chapter 1. Though we do find out that there is a God. We find out later that he loves us. He created us to seek him out. To find him, to obey him. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. He has clearly given us a path to him. We find that in the plan of salvation, as we commonly call it. We must read his word. We must be familiar with it. We must build our faith, Romans 10, 17. We must believe that word, John 8, 24. We must repent of all of our past sins to put those things away. To cease doing those things, Acts 3 to 19. We also must confess Christ before others, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 3. And then finally, if we, are, if we are to be saved, we must put on Christ in baptism, washing all of our sins away by contacting the blood of our Savior, Acts 22, verse 16. Now that would make you a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else has been stated several times in this pulpit. You're a Christian. You are a child of God at that point. You arise out of that watery grave of baptism to sin no more, to be a child, not only that, but a servant of your Creator. However, if you are a Christian, but you've allowed sin back into your life, we have the next few moments to have that resolved, whether you do want to put away that sin through what we normally call as the second law of pardon or to become a Christian. Please take this time as together we stand and sing. <laughs>